All right. The end of Success Connect is here, but we're not done yet because I have a classic personality <laughs> in the community in my chair. I got Luke Marson. How you doing? I'm doing well. It's good to see you, John. I was just uh, talking with you before we started taping about doing uh, a video hangout with you and Jarrett on success as a success factors consultant, which was, I think, around a decade ago, something like that, maybe a little something give like or that. take. Yeah. And uh, wow, it's fascinating to watch this whole thing evolve, isn't it? Yeah. How would you say, first of all, your career has evolved since the early days of being a success factors consultant? Yeah, I've seen quite a lot of changes um, in the ecosystem and with myself, of course. So, you know, I used to be like really hands on, you know, I was lead consultant and solution architect. And I worked a lot of, a lot of projects, worked with uh, at, at the, the luck of working with Brandon Toombs on some projects in his uh, early days of his career. That was yeah. super cool. Um, you know, I, I and he became of, a big fixture in the community as well. So. Super big, and he's adding a lot of great content to the ecosystem right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've uh, over the years I moved into founding my own company, yeah, and that got acquired, and that's seen me do all sorts of bits and pieces and work with customers, all different levels, more customers, more senior people. Talking about strategies as well for not just implementation but roadmaps. You know what customers want to do in the longer term and how they want to to grow their their business in the HR. So that's been super fun. Um, you know, but it means that I'm unfortunately not as in the weeds with uh, success factors as I was. But you know, I try to keep my hands dirty with that stuff. So, so what kind of drives you to keep going? Like, what, where's your passion in all of this? What do you like? I think it's the same as it always has been. Same as a lot of a lot of us. It's it's customer success. We mm. want we want customers to be successful. We want them to be able to develop their HR processes, supported by the technology, to bring better business outcomes, to improve the careers of people, to provide better experiences for those people at work, and you know, that is something that that drives a lot of us, and something that uh, you know, I continue to try and do. On a daily basis. I want to get back to that later in the podcast because I think that's something that vendors still struggle with, but I think mm -hmm. we've also really sharpened the customer success conversation in a number of ways. Part of that comes out of the metrics that we're getting better at in the SaaS mm -hmm. community around measuring that actual progress, which I think is really important, but also yeah. I think just helping vendors to understand that open, transparent communication is at the heart of a lot of this, which is why I wanted to talk with you, is that um, so so much of what we see still at, at events is kind of a one-way branding exercise, and yet mm -hmm. the real cool stuff and the real breakthroughs come sharing stories, learning from each other, having these peer conversations, getting yeah. advice from you know, consultants like yourself. And to me, like the, the real mission of the consultant is to be that expert truth teller and to be able to say, no, I'm not going to do whatever this customer wants. I'm going to help them to understand. Here's how you can get into trouble and here's better ways of doing yeah. it. To me, that's the conversation that really matters. S s sorting through the mud um, yeah. and finding the gems. Yeah. And that includes how do I apply various technologies and we're going to get in, into that. So I'm going to revisit the customer success conversation, but let's talk just a little bit about uh, the show so far. I want to get to the news in a minute, but just tell us kind of what you did at the show and what you learned. I mean, I pretty much spent most of my time talking with customers. I'm um, spending a lot of my time up on the show floor. Um, there were a lot of customers coming up to, to booth, walking around, just, just speaking with customers. Sometimes in the evening, sometimes in the daytime, at lunch, whatever. I'm just uh, seeing what they're doing, trying to trying to understand you know, what 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 are the actual trends on the ground. Because we hear the marketing, and we hear what we you know, SAP want us to hear, but there's sometimes a I would say a disconnect between the marketing and the reality. I think we all know that's the case. Well, there's always going to be a gap at a show between what vendors are pushing on the keynote stage and what matters most to customers. And it's just a matter of figuring out what those differences are and whether we can bridge those things. You saw some stuff that I don't think was discussed in the keynote. Tell us about some of the trends you saw. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the things I'm seeing mainly uh, topics around like onboarding migration. This is, a, this is a really big topic. I mean, 
you know, not had to promote my company, but we built an RPA-based solution to, to migrate this. And because of that, people have been coming to us and talking about that, you know, what they're planning to do. There's a lot of customers that don't align with how SAP want to position this. You know, a lot of what SAP is saying is there's a transformation opportunity here. You know, you can, you can optimize and transform your onboarding. But the reality on the ground is a lot of customers are moving because they have to. They might do some transformation as part of this migration because, just because mm. they can, but that's not really what they're looking at right now. It's, mm-hmm. They are kind of forced into doing something which is spending money without getting an ROI from it. Mm-hmm. They've got an onboarding process that works. They've got a solution that does what they want it to. And to be frank, the onboarding 2.0 solution, it's good, but it still has a couple of issues. And I had a couple of customers you know, come up to me and, and they're not totally happy with the onboarding mm-hmm. 2.0 solution. It's called onboarding, but we'll use 2.0 to, mm-hmm. to, to save the confusion with the 1.0 solution. So that's a real challenge right now for customers is they've got to move off a, a, a stable solution. They've got the processes in place. They've got all this set up. It's all working. Mm-hmm. And now they're going to go to something which potentially in some areas might set them back. There are other benefits they're going to get, but customers never like to lose something mm-hmm. and be forced to lose it and be forced to pay for that. And, mm. and not really be able to necessarily show anything for the money they spent after the fact. Right. And this is something that I think SAP need to, need to figure out how they're going to address other than saying it's a transformation opportunity. Because, mm. yeah, there will be companies that, that, that do that. And a lot of companies should look at, look at that opportunity. But mm. it's not the driver for most customers that I spoke to. Right. So given that when SAP makes these kinds of decisions, they're generally like pretty firm decisions around, okay, you got to move to 2.0 like it's going to happen. What can SAP do in your opinion to, to make that ease, easier and better for customers despite the, in addition to, shall we say, the transformation pitch, what other things could they do to make it better? Yeah, well, you know, I have to give them credit because they've put on quite a few sessions here um, to cover the onboarding migration, what customers should look at, things they need to consider. Mm. So that's a really good starting point. So they need to push more of that content out so customers can start getting prepared for this. But they need to come up with strategies and tactics for customers and for partners on how they can uh, rapidly move some of the configuration and some of the um, existing processes from the one to the other with the minimal amount of effort. Mm. Because... Yeah, as I mentioned, there's a lot that has to be done in this. It's essentially a re-implementation to get no necessary outcomes. So we also need to work to, to highlight the real benefits and the, maybe provide some kind of transformative approach on how customers can approach this in a way that's going to give them some benefits that they're not getting mm. today from 1.0. In the meantime, it's keeping you busy, so that's something, right? Yes. <laughs> it's kept me very busy the last couple of days. Yeah. So what else has popped up in terms of customer feedback that you've gotten? I've heard a few things. Skills have come up in a couple of conversations. We're going to get to skills. Yep. AI hasn't come up in any conversations, so mm-hmm. that's something that um, I think... I think, you know, SAP are pushing the AI message a lot, um, and... They've they've done a pretty good job at that, but ultimately, you know, AI is not about technology; it's about outcomes. And mm. you know, you as you as you mentioned as we were chatting before this about like the uh, the job analyzer um, and uh, that technology having recruiting, customers care that it can find phrases and words that are not appropriate. They don't care whether it's an AI technology underneath or not. They just care that it actually delivers a value. Yeah, and that's what SAP have to do is to show. Um, value, show outcomes. This is, we've, we've got this technology and it does this. Mm. It brings this benefit to the table. That's where customers really care. They don't, they don't care if it's AI, ML, RPA, or any of these acronyms, right? It's all about, it's all about the, the business outcomes at the end of the day. I think you're right. And I, I think it's, it's really refreshing to have you put it that way because ultimately that's how we should evaluate any of these technologies as they should be incorporated into processes com- customers want to improve and problems they're trying to solve. It's that simple. And, you know, I think AI is a little bit different because for some people it does create uh, some uncertainty around the future of their own 
their own roles. They rightly wonder sure. about some of the limits of that at times. There's also pricing considerations. Some of the new technologies are expensive. <laughs> Uh, we don't know exactly about that yet. We're going to hear more after the show. So mm -hmm. I think that will be interesting. And then there's also, I think, and you may not have heard this from customers in your discussions, but I think there's also an additional, in addition to outcomes, there's also data privacy and, and other questions around how are you getting this in the case of AI? That's the only reason the technology matters really yes. is how are you using my data becomes important there. And that may yeah. be important for other technologies as well, but it's especially important for AI. Right. And, and to SAP's credit, they've worked hard to answer yeah. those questions, but those are things I think that are gonna, just because SAP's answered them once, that's not how it works. Yeah. This is one thing we've been talking about a lot this fall is that this is an ongoing conversation. It's not something you solve, yeah. you know. It takes a long time for yeah. information to disseminate and flow down to yeah. partners, to customers, to, to uh, everyone else in the ecosystem and and as we've seen with chat gpt you know it, it's trading on these large models but we've seen we've seen controversies where you know some companies have, have been using copyrighted works stuff right. that people own to train these ais and not not even paying for that right and so there are, there are you know I, and of course i don't expect sap to do that but you're right there are considerations around what is the data source to train these yeah. uh, large language models that they might use in some of their AI technology. Where's that coming from? And 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 are customers knowingly or unknowingly signing off the, the the ability for SAP to use their data to build out these models and basically make money? And I think that brings us into the skills conversation because I happen to believe that for HR vendors, getting AI right is about getting the data right, and getting mm -hmm. the data right and getting talent right is about getting skills right. <laughs> and so you're yeah. back to the skills problem and the problem of skills data because if you want to talk about any kind of transformation in talent or hiring or anything like that, and I went to some presentations on that this week from customers, you have to get this skills piece nailed down because otherwise you're stuck with archaic, what I would call legacy rules-based engines that I think ex end up excluding more people <laughs> than actually like helping them to advance their careers in a lot of cases. And so I think the technology has potential there, but it gets back to what are you doing with skills? And you know, it, it was interesting just to talk with customers because you know, a lot of customers, I think, are looking for more from success factors in that area, at least from my perception. What is, what is your general view of the skills conversation in the community? So, b back when I started out my career, as you probably know, I was big into Nikisa. I was yep. doing a lot of stuff with succession planning then, and a lot of that was based around what SAP called uh, qualifications or competencies. But in the end, it's it's quite similar to skills. and a lot of what was being done then was driven around identifying what skills, competencies, qualifications, whatnot were on positions and what people had and trying to do matching um, of that. And that's something that hasn't changed, but it's been a big gap in success factors. Mm. It's been a gap for probably 10, 12 years. So people in the on-premise world had this kind of capability um, more maybe rudimentary than, than, than today's um, skills topic, but still it was kind of there and it hasn't been in success factors. And I think that for me has been a big gap which is now being filled finally. Mm -hmm. um, but skills drives a lot of things, recruiting, succession planning, career yeah. development. But there's a whole ton of areas, as you mentioned, you know, it's, a, it's a big part of talent management and it's good to see that that's there. Um, it'd be interesting to see how you know, skills libraries can get integrated and utilized um, in success factors and how they're going to be able to use all of these, you know, all the skills data across different modules, mm -hmm. how you can be able to report, how you can use it in recruiting, how do you identify people outside of your system? So when you're recruiting someone, you know what skills are needed for the position, but how do you identify from a candidate's resume or, or, or their candidate profile what skills they have and how do you validate that? And how do you get them to provide the skills in a way which matches with how you have them? And that's a, that, that's a pretty big challenge, I think, that vendors are gonna have to look at. Um, you know, do you have, you, know, you build out software to pass the resume and pick out the skills from that based on right. what's in your, your skills database? Right, and the classic sort of problem with skills ontologies, which has to change if we're gonna have a, if it's gonna mean what we think it can mean is, 
it's got to be this easily updated dynamic thing. It can't be mm -hmm. this like stale repository that grows older with each day, right? And so we're yeah. going to need every everything. Like it's going to have to be well designed because AI can't do that on its own. AI nope. can't decide that Luke is suddenly interested in underwater basket weaving. Like, <laughs> you know, you have to tell the system that that's an interest. Like, yeah. and, and then that has to be validated in some way, right? And, and that you've yeah. actually accumulated certain skills in certain areas. And, and, and like, I don't care how good the AI is. It can't, it can't read that like that because that's no. not documented. And so, like, but if you can create a more dynamic skill system, to me, that implies the possibility of pretty transformative stuff inside of organization in terms of how you treat higher and advanced people and, and even higher people that in the past you excluded because you weren't even aware that they existed in your, in your database. So I think it's potentially exciting, but there's a lot of work to do, right? Yeah. Yeah, there is. Um, and it's not all system-based. As you said, it's, it's having the processes in place for people to keep make sure that they're updating their profiles as they right. acquire new skills. Um, it's about organizations as they change and they develop, um, that they are introducing the new skills that they need into their right. systems, into their processes, um, and, and, and aligning all of these things together. Because as we see, as we've just seen, even just in the success factor space, things have changed a lot over the last few years. And the skills that are required to right. use these new systems to um, up, uh, you know, utilize new processes, um, transform your business. These things are changing on a regular basis, and right. organizations have have to keep up with that. But so do vendors as well. Absolutely. Um, and that's whether that's the, the the vendors like success factors providing the systems, or it's the the companies that are providing the skills, libraries, and and ontologies, and so forth. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting story to watch, and I. You know, having back and forth with Success Factors leadership as part of our analyst program, a lot of that content was was non-disclosure. Though I did publish a piece today that had some information that that I that I'm good to share. And some of the non non-disclosure, by the way, will come out over time, so it's just more temporary in some cases. But um, but you know, part of the discussion is kind of where is Success Factors strengths and weaknesses? How are they positioned? And you know, hearing a lot of stuff, which I agree with around things like localization, globalization, glo you know, the, that broader footprint, all the industry capabilities, all the integration with all the various SAP systems, improved field glass integration, all this kind of stuff for more fluid workforce management all makes sense to me, but I do come back to skills a little bit yeah. <laughs> because I'm like, you have all this other amazing stuff, but somehow in the middle of that has to be this powerful skills engine if you really want to call yourself a modern talent software platform. Oh, 100%. You know? So it's kind of interesting. You can have all these tentacles and you can have all this amazing tech, but you got to have this skills thing. And, and so when I hear customers saying, oh, I use this for skills and import it and stuff, and I've heard that a few times. I didn't take a survey, so I may not have a good read entirely. I don't like to hear that, right? I want to hear them say, I use success factors for skills, and it was fantastic. And I've been told that next year I'm in for some big, pleasant surprises like um, you know, as, as they advance into this. And I, I think they're committed to it, but it will be interesting to see. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm very excited to see what keeps coming in the skills area in success factors. And there has been progress made. I mean, they, I think they posted something in May. I'm not sure if I still have it up on my browser, but it was in excess of 25,000 documented skills and stuff, and that was from last May. So there are, you know, stuff like that happening where, you know, we're not at square one anymore. It's just that we see more room, right? Yeah. So let's go back a little bit to customer success because, you know, you spent a lot of time on projects over the years and also, you know, managing your firm's successes and challenges. What, what has really emerged for you in terms of like, you know, I guess we could kind of tackle both of them, but I'd love to hear more about warning signs when projects are going wrong and also really good signs that this is going to be a really good project. What, what kinds of things do you see that help you to identify that? So I'll tackle the, lad, the, the latter one of those two first. You know, I, yeah, I, I've seen quite recently, actually, uh, uh, with a project that we're just preparing to kick off in a couple of weeks, you know, having, having a customer that's really well organized um, and very detail-oriented and getting the planning started not weeks but months ahead of a project. Mm. Um, that is super important. 
with the customer right now, and, and, and they've been planning for this project for a long time. You know, they, they're getting on calls to, to make sure people in all different countries understand what's coming, what sort of things they have to do, how much time commitment they need. Because that's always a big challenge is people being able to find the time or not realizing how much time mm. they're going to need to spend on these projects. A, you know, when, you're, when you're doing a HR transformation, uh, you're putting an employee central, that's a big deal. It touches a lot of the business. Mm. There's a lot of stuff that has to be done. And there's a lot of work there. And that's before you take into account things like data migration um, and integration and stuff like that. Just the process design and getting all the right data fields in place that you need to have the right information to support those processes. It's a hell of a lot. And having a good project manager in place you know, you can tell, I think, quite early on the approach of a project manager and how the things that they are saying, the things that they're doing are going to impact the project. You know, whether they are good or bad, that become, it can become quite apparent. And I've seen in some cases where a customer wants to use a PM from their own company. And I like it when a customer gets an independent project manager in because that person is coming in without biases. Yeah, they're getting paid by the, by, by the company, but they're getting mm. paid to manage and make the project a success. Right. And they come in without those biases because you sometimes find a, a, an internal employee that, that takes this on. Well, look at their own company's interests and so there's not that of the partner. And the key word there is partner. This is a partnership between your system integrator and you as a customer. And you'll only get success if you work together. But if, if, if the customer just works on their own, doing their own things, making unilateral decisions, um, and, and, and just deciding that they, they want to change how the scope of the project and don't want to pay for that, that's just going to rub the partner up the wrong way. And then you start to, projects start to, you lose, lose control of projects at that point. Mm -hmm. And once that starts happening, it's very hard to pull it back together. And then you end up, yeah, you might end up going live, but you're not going to end up with the success that you require there. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, it really is about working together, planning, planning together, executing together. And sometimes things change in a project um, and customers just have to realize sometimes you, you change something and you, have to, you sometimes have to pay for that. You know, as, as an SI isn't a charity, then they're not going to work for free. Um, and you shouldn't expect them to take on the burden that you've, you've created there. I want to ask you something and see how it fits in with your view on project success. Um, we, talked, we talked earlier about customer success, which has really become a discipline. I mean, you can actually read mm -hmm. books on this topic now um, that have kind of been formulated and driven by SaaS things, things like churn and things like measuring satisfaction. You can measure adoption utilization rates and you know feature adoption rates and stuff like that. And some of those things are really useful, but to me, like what I would really like to see is customers kind of owning a little bit more of what success is going to look like for them, because it strikes me that it would be incredibly helpful for both you and the vendor, in this case, SAP, and the customer to have early meetings at kickoff saying, asking the customer, what does success look like for you? Like, what do you really want out of this project? To your point, are, are you just trying to get onboarding sorted? <laughs> Or do you have some broader agenda that you would like to achieve in terms of something that you want to improve as far as your employee engagement? Okay, well, how do you define that and how are we going to measure that? And to me, getting that and then agreeing upon how that's going to be measured and, and tracked along the way, to me, that's a, a real breakthrough if I compare that to how big ERP projects used to work. Does that jive at all with your views on how you would go about things? Or Oh, absolutely. Um most technology inf implementations are done for a reason. You know, right. A HR transformation. Um, maybe your old, your old payroll system's got issues. You want to put a new one. As you said, onboarding migration. A lot of the time, the customer is doing this for a particular reason. They, 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 they maybe you know, they want to get an ROI out of something. You know, they want to improve the employee experience. You know, they just want to get their payroll accuracy up from you know, mm. maybe say 80% to close to 100 So. There's always a reason why something is being done. So then you should be able to translate that into success. So how do you measure success? So for my the, the example there, it's quite rudimentary, but the, the, the whole payroll, yeah, I'll go from accuracy from 80% to 100%. Well, that's quite easy to measure. 
But if you're looking at something like um, employee, improving employee experience, right. that is, it's not something black and white. It's not a percentage. Yeah. It's something that's more difficult to measure. And, and, and of course, there's a whole wide range of, of, of reasons why projects are getting initiated in the first place uh, and these big software purchases are made. And it's important. I think mean, you're absolutely right. It's important to sit down um, at least the customer and the and the SI together and figure this out before they start so that they can use this as a, as a, as a kind of driving point in the project and the measuring stick at the end. But I think for SAP, you know, they ought to have skin in the game. I mean, right. they, they want all their customers to be successful. We know that. That's something that they talk about. Um, but they, they, they should be getting involved and, and even maybe driving that conversation. Maybe they bring methodologies um, uh, or they bring something to the table to help the SI and the, and the partner, uh, so and the customer come up with this because not every, not every SI is, 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 is an expert at, at putting these things together, even though it's something that they want to do. They want the success. I mean, companies like mine, we live and die by our successes. We, we need references. We need customers to be successful. And that, that drives part of the way we approach projects. But you know, the customer is being driven by something a bit different. You know, they have something quite clear, uh, clear goals that they want to get out of it. And it's just, and, and, and you have to figure out how, how you can measure that. Uh, and, and not just once you've finished, but as you're going through the project, um, what things can you measure there that's showing that the project is on track to get right. you where you need to be? To me, where I would like to see this go ultimately is that once a project, once we agree collectively on these things, the key stakeholders, uh, I'd like to see a, a, a situation where then the partner, SAP, and the customer all have like a daily dashboard they can go to where they can literally track that stuff. And you could have an alerts-based infrastructure even that alerts people if certain, and maybe AI is involved a little mm -hmm. bit in, 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 in tweaking that and right, making recommendations. But the point is, you should be able to see that on a daily basis. Yeah. You know, we're, we're pretty good at measuring other stuff, like we should be good at this. And I don't know any vendor in the entire enterprise space that has exactly what I'm describing, but I know one vendor that's, I think, a lot closer than anyone else. And I'm not going to say their name because they're an SAP competitor, although not an HR. But the point is, like, to me, that would be really cool because then you could literally on a daily basis, like kind of revisit that if you need to. And obviously more realistically speaking, it'd be more like a monthly review probably. Yeah. But the point being like, when you look at the real project failures in our space, and, and there have been a lot of them in HR, especially in, especially in the public sector, which seems mm -hmm. to be a real bugaboo for pretty much every vendor. Yep. Like you read them and, and a lot of times your my reaction is always, how did they go so long? Like they went a year or two, like too far down this path without an intervention where everyone was like, what the hell is going on here? That's the common denominator to me is like how far these customers get down a bad path. And to me, there's got to be a way of making it possible for the to just be aware of much more early indicators of like, hey, let's talk about this. <laughs> this isn't going right. Yeah. You know? Absolutely, and I know that SAP might say that kind of system a partner should come up with, but let's say, let's say my company develops that kind of dashboard. Well, that only helps my customers. That right. doesn't help other customers. Right. Um, and I'm not a software vendor that's going to make and license this kind of stuff out. Maybe a vendor like SAP or right. their competitors, they should build this type of application and they right. give it to the customers, part of the subscription, and you have this dashboard so you can see those things, yeah. you can be successful. So don't rely on partners and their unique methodologies and their right. differentiators because that only helps certain customers. You, you wanna provide something that is, is for every customer. And that sort of thing is not specific to HR. You can give them that for anything, S4 HANA, Ariba, whatever the customer mm. is implementing give them that kind of dashboard so they can track those things and they can keep on track. And the vendor can, can access that. So the, yeah. the customer engagement executive can see it. So that red, when the red flags start coming up and, and, and you know, the, there is, you know, a, a customer's doing something or a partner's doing something that's taking it in the wrong way, SAP can say, hold on a second. Right. Well, we've, we've seen what's happening here. You, you, we need to start. We need to talk about why is this happening and how can, right. we, how can we get this back on track? Bingo. To me, that's... That's the future we need to get to, and I hope we do someday. But in the meantime, we can have these conversations, and, and, and in the meantime, to your point, while ultimately I think the, the vendors who kind of rule over those ecosystems need to take responsibility for this, in the meantime, I think 
you know, creative partners can also forward this conversation to a point and, mm -hmm. and, and at least serve your customers better. And then, but as you point out, this is not something that you, <laughs> customer success should not be limited to one particular partner or partner right. approach. Is yeah. Absolutely not. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I wanted to just briefly talk about um, just interesting things you've seen from customers. I went to some sessions that were, they were really cool and really eye-opening in different ways. And it's, it's nice to see that SAP is able to support customers operating at massive scale. I mean, I went to, you know, uh, some pretty massive scale customer presentations for the likes of, say, Starbucks and Kohl's and stuff like that. And there were a couple of things that really interested me. One, in Kohl's, I loved how he talked about the omni-channel employee experience in a way because it wasn't so much the buzzwords, but I like that he used omni-channel in the employee context because usually that's used in a consumer context. I talk yeah. about all the different ways that consumers want to interact with systems. But I love that idea that employees need the same benefit, right? Which is, I could be on my phone, I could be you know, on my tablet, I could be whatever I'm doing, like you know, I could be have a voice interaction maybe, but, but I'm always like, able to tap into the system. I thought that was really cool. And in that same presentation, he talked about like, how they set up this kind of the, this, this job scoring thing that allowed them to essentially hire a more diverse applicant pool um, based on different ways of weighting candidates, which is kind of a pre-AI type of exercise. But it was really cool to see how they automated a lot of that because they have to hire this massive global scale, and yet how can we hire a more diverse applicant pool? And it was really neat to hear their stories. And then Starbucks, I really enjoyed talking. I, pull, I pulled a Starbucks presenter aside after his presentation, and I asked him about something that's really bothered me in retail for a long time, which is... This it gets back to what I was just talking about, but this uneven relationship between customers and employees, where customers are walking into the store in the case of Starbucks with an award-winning digital app, and they pre-ordered their elaborate drinks and stuff, and you look at these employees and they're like hustling behind the counter, like trying to manage all this crap, and I'm amazed at how good they are at doing that. But I, I asked him, I was like, isn't it time to like give employees? your employees like a little more technology, a little more ability to even that relationship a little bit and, and give them more, you know, they, obviously Starbucks isn't gonna pay their employees like, like corporate executives, but can they at least arm them with better technology? And he said, by coincidence, he said, I'm presenting on a topic related to this, which was today, I didn't see this one, but he had built out a, a on BTP, which has been pretty actively used in success factors, a benefits app that allows employees to basically claim a lot of benefits that they have to claim and do in a self-service way because if they don't, they don't get all, all the benefits and stuff. And so, but it was really all about thinking about how can we make our employees' lives better using this technology. And to me, like if customers are going down that road, like that's a great road to go down, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we often see these type of really cool things are often with the big customers you mentioned, it's yeah. all these huge customers, the Starbucks, the Nike, the Disney, yeah, yeah. with the big budgets to be able to do these sort of things. Right. A lot of the customers you know, I speak to, they want to, they just want to be able to do mobile clock in and out. Right. You know, like Start with the basics. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it, uh, it goes back to things like a lot, a lot of, a lot of organizations are trying to, they, they first want to tackle the, the, you know, the, the basic stuff. Like, I, I, need to, I need to get a single system of record. I need to get ESS. Yeah, I need to get yeah, MSS yeah. out. And that's where I start my employee experience journey. Right. You know, and then moving to building out the talent management programs. And then moving towards analytics. And then you know, full on employee experience. So um, you know, a lot of companies have to go quite far down their journey before they're kind of getting yeah. to that point, which is why we always see these cool things come out of these massive companies that have got multi-million pound, dollar, euro, whatever budgets um, to spend right. on this sort of thing. Um, and, it, and it would be great if, there were, you know, if, if, cust if the, I'd say, smaller customers maybe um, or, or, or less cool customers um, yeah. were... You know, able to do this, but it's not every company that that can sure. do that that has has the capability to do that. Um, For sure, I think one of the hopes of that sort of app store environment is that by building apps instead of just doing custom shit, that at least eventually it can be potentially reused by other customers 
but to your point, there has to be a readiness to adopt. And, and just as a contrast, I went to a, a, a consultant presented on, you know, becoming a skills-driven organization. And after some people linger with questions, and one of the last questions I heard being asked of him was like, we're basically a nonprofit in California and, you know, we have all these regulations and we can't possibly move to skill. Like, but it was more like what you're describing of like, we're kind of under duress and we, we'd love to do this, but we don't see how we could. And, but those are good conversations to have also. And they, they, you know, they had a long back and forth, but it was just, you know, to your point, like, I think you do have to meet the customers where they're at. But one thing I would turn the tables on you a little bit though, and say that while that may be true in terms of customer size and level of innovation, I think f from a partner community spec perspective, I kind of look at it differently. There's a reason why I like to talk with folks that work for smaller partners, which is not to say that large partners can't also do cool stuff because they haven't certainly done so. But I'm really biased towards smaller partners because I, I just feel like the level of ambition and creativity I see from smaller services partners is really important to vendor yeah. communities. And that's why I like to interview folks like you. So. Yeah, I mean, again, not here to, to promote my company, but we've been doing a lot of stuff recently with RPA. We're building extensions on workforce right. software. We've been using BTP and RPA to put process, uh, to, to have like document verification in the recruiting process, for example, right. or s simple things like integrating um, Employee Central and DocuSign and, and onboarding a DocuSign so you can use it on your mobile because you right. can't do that in the onboarding solution. And that's what companies like us do. You know, there were companies, some of our competitors were, were, were nearby and I saw some of the things that they were doing and they're, you know, they're solving problems for customers that SAP aren't solving. And SAP can't solve every problem. Right. They don't have the, the time or the budget. And sometimes there's solutions, SAP aren't gonna maybe build a solution for just 20 or 30 customers, but I will. Mm -hmm. You know, other comp other similar size SIs like us will do that because yeah. because because yeah, for us there's a business case for that, but for SAP there isn't. You know, they're looking to targeting you know hundreds and thousands of customers with solutions, and so that's where you know you're right. These these smaller partners um, have a vital role to play in that innovation because they they you know they can churn out these kind of capabilities to solve customer problems on a scale that SAP just they just they just they just won't look at and i think that's really cool because 15 years ago when i worked with smaller partners it was mostly collections of senior expert consultants that had become disillusioned with working for the big vendors and they mm -hmm. banded together to form this like swat team vibe and they went out and kicked ass on products and that was great but what i hear now more is is using platforms like success actors platforms to take that expertise and turn it into actual products and IP and, and yeah. apps that customers can use. And I think that's a really exciting trend because that's a much more repeatable thing than just going yeah. into a project and being like, oh, I'm, you know, this is the best configuration guy on the planet, right? I mean, that that's cool, but like, come on, like let's let, let's serve a broader community interest. And I really love that idea of yeah. turning that into IP like you're describing. Yeah, and, and you, you also brought up the app store. And and that's a really great thing because, you know. Companies like mine and, and, and some of our competitors can build these solutions and then put them in the app store so they're accessible easily because so, you know, one, one customer came up to us and, and mentioned uh, their workforce software customer and I said, oh, we've got this clock in, clock out mobile solution. And eyes lit up because workforce software actually doesn't do that. And they were like, I only came over because um, somebody I know told me to go and check you out. Otherwise, I never would have found this. Right, like how, and that's an, that's actually a, a, an issue I hadn't thought about. But you know, there's no a lot of these solutions aren't getting pushed out to customers. There's all this innovation on the yeah. app store, and it's easy to get apps on the app store now, which is great for partners that are building them because the process is quite yeah. straightforward. But customers are kind of missing out, I think, sometimes because there's not always the visibility to to these apps and to these innovations, um, and also the app store has so many apps and it can get lost uh, i think sometimes in the sea of very similar apps so yeah. i think maybe 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 there's a couple of different approaches sap can take there towards the app store and towards these you know the different types of innovations and and weeding out the you know a lot of overlapping capability right and this is a longer conversation we can have maybe at another point but there's there's also possibilities that i think are really under nourished not just by SAP but most large vendors sales forces are driven by their big ticket sales items obviously they'd rather sell a you know success factor suite than than someone's app I totally get that but sometimes selling the differentiated app 
has actually turned out to be the key to selling the whole thing. Yeah. Because if you're down on a short list and you're comparing features and functions and how can this, it can be a deal breaker if you don't have certain things that my company has to have. And you can talk about custom builds and everything like that. But I've seen situations where a partner can go out on the uh, BTP enabled platform or whatever and build a demo over the weekend and say, we can build this for you. And so I think sometimes, sometimes an, a, an aggressive, innovative partner can actually help close the whole deal. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's great that SAP pay commission to their account executives on solutions that get sold from right. the app store in their deals because it incentivizes them to find that right. solution and, uh, and, and find a way to solve a customer problem. And it can just be, as you say, it can just be that one app that's not even that expensive they, that they, that's on the app store that can be the differentiator right. for SAP to close that deal against the competitor. Exactly. So I do want to wrap. Um, we've had great luck with this quiet room, but I know they're eager to break this room down. Whenever there's an empty room like this at the end of a show, the clock is like there's a timer clicking in the background. Yep. So it's like five or ten people are going to come in here pretty soon and start crashing chairs. But um, but I know I know one of the things that that has been cool about how you've evolved is I think you've evolved more and more kind of into big picture issues. And so when you think about putting the tech aside and AI aside, like when you think about sort of the future of work, are there things that you're really tracking as far as this is how work is changing that we need to be aware of or that you're interested in? Yeah, I mean, the pandem pandemic, of course, was a big driver for changing mm -hmm. a lot about work, um, a lot about trends and behaviors, um, you know, with remote work becoming bigger. Um, you know, work itself, is, is is changing in, in certain ways you see and, and you can see this through, through some things SAP are doing as well like with dynamic teams you know companies are doing a lot more things where they form mini teams to do things people are getting more experiences um, within their work because mm -hmm. I think companies have figured out that uh, people who can learn different parts of the business that they work in can contribute more to the business overall. They can get more done. They know who to go to. They know how these different processes work in, in this department over here or in that department over there. Um, that kind of internal talent mobility is something that I think has proven to be valuable in the past and is, I've seen some of it. I think there's still a lot mm -hmm. more companies can do in that kind of area, for example. Um, but you know, yeah, the, the whole skills, career development, that stuff is 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 really being to snowball as you know as you know from the conversation mm -hmm. we've already had about that thing um today and we're, we're, i mean a lot of these thing these trends they 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 come from reactions to the market i mean we you know right now it's really hard to find people right it's hard to it's hard to find talent a lot of people have got jobs that you either you either have to poach people or develop people and so, again, it comes back to that. Uh, it's either attracting uh, talent or developing it, career development, using skills to find people, using, getting people the skills that they need mm -hmm. to grow within your company and, and, and fill the current and future needs that you're going to have. Um, and, again, that for me, I mean, it's a bit of a passion of mine, but it's something that I think is, uh, I also think, independent, that is a really important area of 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 of, of the now of work as well as the future of work. And we're gonna see that as people come into the workforce and are often working more and more remote, you need to develop the skills in those people because the education system is not gonna do that. Yep. So companies need to figure ways of how can, how can we develop the skills in people to be able to work autonomously, to work in a team, to work in a team virtually um, and to be able to get things done. How can, we, how can we train managers to be able to manage people remotely instead of by sight? You know, and, and ensuring yeah. that, that people understand how to achieve and show the results that they're getting the work done when people can't see them and don't know where they are. Because there's a changing mentality in that, but there's also um, strategies and skills needed to be able to uh, allow all of that to happen. Yeah, for sure. And I think one really interesting storyline in all of this, I have a whole separate stump speech about how, uh, I have a whole separate stump speech about how um, corporations are not taking 
full advantage of what I think are talent pools that they're that they're not able to tap into either because work arrangements aren't flexible or enough or they don't have a good enough upskilling and training program and things like that. So that's a whole nother, another rabbit hole. But in general, I think what I what I find encouraging in the outlook for the next 20, 10 to 20 years is that for a while it looked like we weren't going to have a talent conversation anymore. We were just going to have an automation conversation. But if you look at just about every industry, you take manufacturing and class manufacturing classic example. You talk to manufacturers, they'll say, I need all the automation I can get and I need all the talent I can get too. Yes. And what's really cool is seeing that those things are not, at least in the foreseeable future, they're not in conflict. Now, we can have a whole different conversation 10 or 20 or 30 de- years down the road when we actually have cognitive systems instead of, what I would call the fairly dumb AI of today. Sorry, AI practitioners. Um, but 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 at the moment, those things aren't in conflict. And in the foreseeable future, they're not. And so the great thing is you and I can have these talent conversations still because talent really, really matters. And, and we can concede that automation and workflow automation is all part of it. But... You know, we're trying to free people from administrivia so they can be more human and more capable and more successful, but the talent conversation has to happen. So that, I, li- I like that. Absolutely, yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head. Automation will help streamline jobs. It'll take some jobs away, but, but if it needs people to, to, yep. to, to operate that, it needs people to then go and find new ways for companies to do things. I mean, ultimately companies will continue to grow. They'll just get, they'll, they'll, they'll get smarter, they'll get more streamlined, but they're not just gonna be like, okay, now we're not gonna do anything else. We're just gonna keep doing everything super streamlined. No, they're gonna look at new ways of growing their businesses and investing in other areas. And you need people to do that. So, you know, people aren't going anywhere. With all the automation in the world, you still need people and you still need talent and you still need the ways of, of giving people the skills and the capabilities to be able to, to be successful and keep growing and driving those businesses. Absolutely. Well, Luke, thanks for the time. It's been great to see your career evolve and uh, wish you much success. Good luck. Thanks for taking the time. And brief shout out to Jarrett Pazahanek because he was always my podcast troublemaker and companion. But uh, the good news is that there was a whole community of peeps that that were part of that. And and you're still around, which is awesome. So great to talk. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, John. Later.